my may i now request uh, ambassador uh, manju uh, seth to please uh, join us thank you so much for coming uh, she is a career diplomat retired from the indian foreign service in 2014 her last assignment was uh, as ambassador of india to madagascar and comoros she has extensive experience in india and abroad in dealing with diverse issues relating to international relations governance policy matters administration publicity media protocol culture and economic and commercial matters seth is an advisor now for international collaboration with organization for diaspora initiatives odi and an advisor with ambra foundation which works on women empowerment issues so much professor kamla it is such a pleasure to be here today can you all hear me yes thank you it's such a pleasure to be here today and to listen in uh, on the and to be a part of this very very interesting um, webinar organized by the grftt which is as you said uh, doing excellent work uh, and and excellent uh, is contributing its uh, uh, the seminars truth seminars to increasing our knowledge on different issues related to migration uh, and you know global migration as well and today i just like to talk uh, a little bit about uh, uh migration uh, in the uae uh, but of course i will mention a little bit about madagascar also uh where i was hosted uh but uh, you know why do people migrate the essential thing is to improve their lives to uh you know make their uh, uh, sort of economic situation uh, better uh and many of these uh, people uh, from india who are migrating abroad for work so many people who are migrating from india to different countries including the uae go for economic reasons and very often they are at the bottom of the socio economic pyramid they're not very well off a large number of them there many of course going as professionals and highly skilled workers uh, but many many of them are going uh, for work and once and they very uh, because of this they are uh, vulnerable and if you look at uh, what has been happening in the gulf uh and uh, you know there are about estimated uh, in in the gulf about 30 million uh, indian my indian migrants uh who have contributed to the economies of these uh, gulf countries and to the uae it is estimated there are about 3.4 million and we don't know how many of them are women there are all kinds of guesstimates but there are a large number of women in the uh, healthcare sector in uh, the uh, Uh, you know as nurses etc and in the retail sector services sector and in addition there are a large number who go as domestic workers and these domestic workers uh, are subject to a lot of uh, uh, uncertainties when they go there because not many of them go with valid uh, uh, what are called employment contracts many of them uh, tend to go on visit visas and then some some of the employers convert them into normal uh, uh, work visas and otherwise they continue to be uh, exploited they become illegal and those who go uh, or illegal uh, you know un undocumented workers they become and so they're completely at the uh, at the uh, in the control of their employers and also because of the kafala system that is in place in the uae where the, uh, the employer uh, is it's sort of in control or controls the, uh, the 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 working conditions and uh, and can does not allow till he gives he or she gives permission for them to uh, change their employment they cannot change their employment and this uh, leads to uh, a lot of uh, uh, exploitation both uh, and abuse there are many cases many instances where our embassies and uh, you know when i was working at headquarters in the division here uh, it was we received so many complaints but unfortunately these complaints could never be proved and because of lack of evidence it's his word her word against his uh, or whoever the lady employee or his or the employer or the um, uh, male employee whoever because the control is so strong uh, that they are unable to get justice or even get out of their uh, of their employment that they have got into and so this uh, is a general and many of them who do manage to escape or run away from their homes where they face abuse both sexual and uh, physical abuse uh, become undocumented and they live in small dormitories and get some part time work somewhere where they're exploited and at the same time now with this uh, uh, 
uh, COVID-19 situation, if you see, they are again, as both Professor Ganesh and Professor Maria have said, that many of them are the most vulnerable. They are at the bottom of the socioeconomic pyramid and they are also undocumented. So when, they, when COVID-19 has broken out, it has affected everybody, but these women or these domestic workers are the most affected. There are, in, I, I believe there are some male domestic workers as well, but their numbers are and the majority of them are women. And so there's no social distancing possible because either they are within the homes or they are living in small dormitories in different uh, places across the city, in, uh, in one of the, in, in the UAE. And no healthcare is available. No, they don't have any access to healthcare. And social distancing doesn't arise because they are all living in small dormitories with five, six, seven people in a small, you know, small room. And so they don't have any uh, recourse to uh, getting health uh, attention if they fall sick neither for um, uh, getting out. Now, the evacuation that is taking place in, um, uh, from, from you know, the world, right? India is evacuating its workers. Now, many of these uh, domestic workers who are living in homes and are employed continue to face whatever exploitation, but the ones who are living outside as part-time domestic workers uh, or uh, you know, living in these dormitories outside, they are in great trouble because they don't have documents. How will they come back? Even if they want to come back to the country, they cannot come back because they don't have documents. Because if you, they want to leave the country, uh, the, any of the, in, in the UAE, they have to pay fines because they've been living, you know, once, once their visa expires, there's a system that you have to pay a certain amount to exit the country. So unless these countries announce an amnesty scheme under which they don't have to pay those fines, these women will be left to the, you know, they cannot move from them even if they want to, even if they are sick, even if they're unemployed. So as in India, you will see, you know, the migrant workers and the poor migrant workers are the worst affected, so too in the UAE. And there is a large number, a large uh, uh, number of these, so they don't even come into the statistics that we are talking of. You know, we are saying uh, there are 3.4 million uh, Indian migrants in the, in, the, in the UAE. They don't even come in, we're not even counting them because they're undocumented. They, and many of them have gone on visit visas. But this is a new thing that has been devised by many unscrupulous agents and uh, employers in the UAE to get people uh, cheaply, get them on work visas, uh, I'm sorry, on visit visas of say 90 days, promise them jobs from here and leave them there, take their passports away and just leave them with the employers. And then after three, uh, uh, for three months, 90 days or whatever their visas, they are, are, are valid. After that, they become undocumented, but they continue to stay there because they cannot come back. Because if you have to exit, they will say, what were you doing here for 90 days? If they say we were working, they, are face, they face a prison term. So they're in a kind of no, uh, uh, non-win-win situation or, or lose-lose situation, whatever they do. And this has become a big, big issue uh, for, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in the UAE, as in other Gulf countries also. But uh, the plus point is, you know, I'm told Bahrain has announced uh, an amnesty and they're thinking and they're hoping that the UAE will also uh, announce one because we have a very large number of uh, workers. And in, in the UAE, I understand that it's the, I haven't got the exact figures because I was going through the various uh, uh, databases, but they don't mention the women, how many women are there? What is the percentage? There are a lot of guesstimates, some say <clears throat> one fourth, some say 30%, but no one is sure of how many women workers uh, and especially women domestic workers are uh, living in the UAE. And now they will not even register to come out. And the other problem is that they're not even covered under the labor laws because they are domestic workers uh, up to two years ago. Actually two years ago, I'm told they were, yeah, there is a, uh, the UAE has brought them under their, under their labor laws. But even then, even though they are covered under the labor laws, only the ones who have their contracts, who go on contracts, with proper contracts, they are the ones who are able to uh, still uh, sort of uh, use or, or be uh, covered under the uh, uh, labor laws. But the minute their contract uh, becomes invalid, so to speak, when they either you know are thrown out by the employers or they want to, or they leave or they, Sort of try and escape the, 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 the harsh conditions under which they are living, uh, they become 
undocumented or illegal workers. And so that becomes a very, very big problem for them. And now in, under COVID-19, if they want to be evacuated again, as I mentioned, they're unable to do so. And this uh, exposes them to a really uh, sad situation where it's a double uh, whammy for them, where they are uh, poor, they don't have uh, jobs, and then they're not able to even come out, come out of the, of, of the country when they, when they want to go back home, if they want to go back home. And many will not go back because of the money. They get some money while they are staying there. Of course, right now, the situation is very, very uh, uh, fragile everywhere, where uh, jobs are few and far between, but domestic, and as Professor Maria said, domestic uh, work as well as healthcare and care as caregivers, women are still wanted, so they will get some kind of jobs, but it has become a very fragile situation for them. In, in, I just briefly, I'll mention a little bit about uh, Madagascar and then come back uh, to UAE. Uh, in Madagascar, the situation was different. You don't have very many, uh, the new diaspora coming in from India, but you have three or four generations of uh, women diaspora who went there uh, in, you know, about four generations ago, five generations ago, they got married and they went. And when uh, Madagascar was still a French colony, but after they, uh, after uh, Madagascar became independent, there is a sort of substantial uh, number of mainly women uh, uh, sort of diaspora who have become stateless. The reason being that at the time of independence, Madagascar uh, did not give, uh, did not give uh, uh, citizenship to everybody. You had to apply. And since these were mainly poor women who were living uh, far away from the capital area, they were wives or even abandoned wives at, at times. So they had no access or no way of applying either for an Indian passport or for French citizenship. I'm sorry, for uh, Malagasy uh, citizenship. And so they were left out of the loop completely. They were invisible. And that's a, that's a term which we see in many of the studies of um, of various, uh, this, you know, they're not visible, they're not in the portrait, they're not anywhere in the picture. They're just forgotten. And that's something similar which has happened even in, um, in, in the UAE. Now, if you see in the recent years, the UAE had, has brought out a, you know, a number of reports uh, showing the progress of uh, women within the UAE, that is the UAE nationals. And, and there has been a mar a quite a marked improvement in their, uh, in their um, status in terms of empowerment, in terms of access to jobs for the local uh, Emiratis. But again, the migrant women from South Asia, from say the Philippines, from various other places, they're completely out of the loop. They're not, uh, they not even in the portrait as they say. Uh, I just wanted to also uh, highlight one last point uh, that you know, uh, in the, uh, uh, remittance figures as well. Though women, uh, you know, as uh, nurses and uh, in, uh, uh, they go as nurses, they go in the retail sector, as I mentioned, the service sector and the hotels, they still, uh, uh, you know, they contribute huge amounts to their families. But again, there is no mention of how much uh, they are able to, they are remitting home. And so there are again no, no um, uh, figures available to, or, or, or data available also contributing. And as Professor Maria said, if they document the GDP, uh, I mean, if they document or they, or they include this in the GDP uh, uh, of any country, it'll add a, a substantive percentage to the GDP of any country. And so domestic work and caregivers, healthcare work, all that, uh, and even housework, you know, for, for, uh, for women is totally not considered as economic activity, as an economic work. And therefore, uh, women tend to be uh, sidelined uh, always. And I had a few policy recommendations which I'll make at a later day, at a later time, and I'll stop now. Thank you. Thank you very much.